Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike and tech related questions. As ever, you can submit your questions down below in the comments section using the hashtag AskGCNTech. So without further ado, Alex. First question is got? from Blue Lactic One. They say, hi GCN, I'm running with Shimano 105. The shifting on, on my rear cassette is fine, but the front derailleur, not so. When it's on the stand, it shifts perfectly from the small ring to the big ring, but on the road, it just doesn't want to shift, especially, well, even when it's not under load. They say usually they get the chains to move by stopping and starting pedaling or back pedaling, but it just doesn't change as smoothly as it does on the stand. However, it does go from the large chain ring down to the small one, okay. Any ideas? Well, if it sounds like you need to you need to set it up. Yeah, <laughs> it does sound like that. Yeah, and it's probably something to do with the limit screws and the way they're currently set up. Although right? that so, said, if you have got the limit screws set correctly and the indexing correctly, something that can sort of hamper a smooth shift up onto the large chain is if some of those um, shifting ramps and pins have been damaged over time. So then, because yeah. effectively all the front derailleur does is just push the chain across. So if some of those aren't helping lift it up on that that could be one of the causes. Yeah, and often people do tend to run chain rings way beyond their lifespan. Yeah. Because it's not always that obvious that they've been worn out. Mm, that's a good point. Mm. Um, double check all the indexing, check the limit screws, and I think that should probably sort the problem out, yeah. shouldn't it? Next in is a question from El Conquistador. Yeah, it says, hey, Alex and Ollie, I oh. recently zeroed my power meter for the first time since buying it last year in May. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> uh, and it suddenly jumped about 60 watts, which is bringing it more in line with my watts from last year, which I thought I'd lost over the winter. The power numbers have gone from 160 to 220. Is this normal or is there something wrong with the power meter? It's a four I I I I I I I I I I left hand crank meter, um, and I also changed the batteries. Maybe this is related as well. I've also zeroed it again, and I'm still getting the same higher numbers. The first thing I'm going to say is I'd probably recommend zeroing your power meter a little bit more than yearly. Yes, I'd recommend <laughs> zeroing it at the start of every single ride, and also as we pointed out in the tech clinic last week. Um, it, don't do that inside your nice warm house by no. the radiator, because and then go and ride outside. Step outside, um, ideally. Get to the right temperature. Yeah, like ride down the road to where you're meeting your friends or whatever, or just ride down the road for five minutes, then zero it. That's the best way to do it, so that the, the temperature you know, doesn't affect it, because strain gauges, which is how power meters work, are affected by heat. It's also a good idea to periodically check the battery as well, because if the battery um, voltage is getting a bit low, it can affect the readings. Yeah. You can quite often do this with the power meter can be paired up to an app, so you can see the condition of the battery, or also some of them pair up to your head unit and show the battery um, level, which is quite a good point. I would also like to congratulate Conquistador for being the first cyclist in the history of the universe to actually complain that their power meter is, is now reading high. Yeah, I've never had that problem. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Next up is a question from Lance uh, Calixtro. Oh yeah, thanks for having me yeah, out. They, <laughs> they say, go on. Hi yeah. guys, I've recently been seeing a lot of monocoque carbon wheels where I'm riding here in the Philippines, like five and by turbo road. It got me thinking, if these wheels are claimed to be lighter and faster than normal spoked wheels, why are they banned by the UCI? Um, well, the UCI have some rules. interesting rules, yeah. and uh, you know it's heavily regulated, isn't it? Yeah. So, so just to be clear, it means like a I don't know, like a tri spoke or something, where it's not like a normal hub and yeah. spokes. It's like a single piece wheel. So the UCI set their own rules and regulations, and as such, they can decide things like the maximum rim depth, the minimum number of spokes that the wheel has to have. But not only that, it has to meet the requirements, but also be tested by the UCI for approval, so that it meets or their rules, but also things like the resistance that impacts, and a lot of that is to go through destructive testing. So the wheels that want to be approved, or the wheel manufacturers that want to have the wheels approved by the UCI, have got to pay for all this, and it comes at a great expense. So if the brand can't see any real value in that, they might not invest their money in meeting those UCI standards if they don't think their product's really going to be used in UCI events. Yeah, I think it also comes back from, say, like, uh, Back in the day when the spinnages were banned, oh, yeah. with like the carbon spokes on those, and, and so some rules hang over from that. And then there's also the thing with the UCI is wanting to preserve the aesthetic of the sport. This is something we see in mountain biking too, and it's why they're not allowed to wear skin suits, even though it would be faster in downhill events. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you start allowing wheels to have like funky monocoque shapes, yeah. 
the bikes start to look quite a lot different. So I mean, that to be is fair, another thing. I kind of agree with that. You know, if you see a normal road bike with that kind of wheel design on it, it does look kind of futuristic, I guess. Mm. But I'm, I'm, I'd be happy for it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Next question is from David Villanel Villanueva. Villanueva. Mm. They say, "Hey y'all, just as a thought experiment, if you had to I love only a thought experiment. <laughs> if you only had to keep one of your brakes and remove the other, would you keep the front brake or the rear brake and why? Would you rather?" Yeah. It's the, obscure would you rather? Um the the front brake does more than the Easily. back brake. Yeah. Uh, it has more stopping power. It's why you often see a bigger rotor on the front brake mm. than the, the rear rotor, because when you're stopping, your weight goes forwards and it loads that front brake more than the rear one. So, uh, front brake. I completely agree with you. <clears throat> Sorry, and if you want to see a really cool image or video that will demonstrate this, check out this really sick shot of me doing a big endo as we made that video, looking at how disc rotor size affects the braking performance. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Brian Lane Carnes. Um, who says, hey, beautiful people. <laughs> Thanks. Don't know who he's talking to. <laughs> Probably you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't know. Uh, have you ever come across a patch for a tubeless tyre? I bought a lovely pair of 45C tyres for my gravel bike last season and got a quarter of an inch puncture on about the fifth ride. That's so annoying when that happens. Yeah. The tyre works fine with a tube, but the hole is too big for a plug. Seems like a patch <clears> would be perfect here but I get that tube patches will not likely work on the inside of the tyre, different material, etc. cetera. Um, you, can, you can patch up yeah. um, tubeless tyres. Yes, it's not necessarily like the ideal solution, but if you've just bought new tyres, it's pretty frustrating, isn't it, to go yeah. out and put a cut in the side of all the tyre. Now, in the past, I have actually repaired a tyre using a normal inner tube patch, and it has worked, worked okay, but there are lots of dedicated products out there designed specifically for the inside of tubeless tires. Yeah, things that you can, that are either, they either have an adhesive on them or you can actually stick them onto the inside. You, you can do repair jobs on these things. Your tire is gonna be sort of structurally weakened. And so, yeah, if you have like a really big important race or event, then you probably wanna use a new tire. But yeah, if you're just like general riding and having fun, yeah, a tire that's be only fine. been used five times. Yeah. I'd want to get more use out of it as well. So yeah, definitely try and uh, try and repair it, and there are ways you can. Yeah, and if you've got those puncture patches, give those a try first before buying any other fancy repair stuff. Yeah, nice. Next question in is from E M. Car username that I can actually read out. Yeah, <laughs> how fast could off-the-shelf bicycle wheels go with an average average weight rider before they would physically fail? What would fail first? At what speed could a wheel seize from heat friction? This is a, a cool question. Yeah, now I actually did a bit of research into this and I've written myself down some notes. Go for it, I wanna so hear it. Yeah. Right, so if you look at the RPM of a road bike wheel, 12 RPM will give you about one mile an hour. So a road bike wheel traveling at 35 mile an hour got an approximate RPM, 430, okay? Now, if we look at the fact that most wheels use a deep groove roller bearing, like that cartridge style, you can replace, lots of those will be fitted with grease and seals, and then typically, a narrow or a deep groove roller bearing, that is like what you'd have fitted to your wheels, will have a maximum RPM of about 14,000 RPM. So what speed is that? Um, so if... Quick maths. Yeah, if you multiply some of this up, in theory, you could have a speed of well over like a thousand mile an hour before you start to get to the point of the bearing not really being up to the job. Right, so it's the bearing's not gonna fail. What I'm gonna say is gonna fail is yeah. the tire. Yeah, the tire would probably fail long before that. Yeah, yeah. because when you look at tires on vehicles that are designed to go a thousand miles an hour. Yeah, they're not using a bike tire. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like vehicles that go hundreds of miles an hour, um, you know, you look at like the landing gear on aeroplanes or if you look at land speed record cars, they have to have yeah. very specific special tyres now to enable them to do that, that are safe and aren't going to blow out. Because yeah. the friction and heat generated on the tyre, plus the forces exerted on the tyre, if that tyre were to hit like a stone or just an imperfection on the road, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I really wouldn't be concerned about your bearings melted, plus the fact that the, the weight of the you and the bike is spread across what, like four or six bearings? And I've actually made a note here, um, steel melts at 1,400 degrees, which we're never gonna reach that temperature on a bike, are you? Yeah. yeah. Although magnesium, 600, so. Well, hopefully you haven't got magnesium bearings. Yeah, maybe don't build. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that answers yeah, the question. There you go. Right, final question yeah. this week is from Jason Duncan, who says, Hi, GCN Tech. I'm six foot four. Congratulations. Yeah. 
and he's struggling to find long sleeve jerseys with an adequate sleeve length. Where can a jolly giant find a proper fit? Well, it's a tricky question to answer this, actually, because it's all going to vary between lots of different brands. They'll all have a slightly different fit and as such a sleeve length. But there are some options out there, some brands that enable you to select whether you want to have a longer cuff option on some of their, some of their clothing. I, I am aware of custom clothing in the past from brands that offer custom clothing. So Endura was one where they used to do different short length. So yeah. you, if you had really long femurs, you could get an extra slightly longer cut short. Uh, but I'm not so familiar with this being done with long sleeves. Yeah. If I think the thing is, we put this out to the audience. If there is anyone watching that's who's aware point. of this, comment in the comment section. If there's anyone else know. that's six foot four and needs to find longer sleeves for their But it's not just about height, because it's what it boils down to is what's known as your ape index. So mm -hmm. it's your span. So you could be whatever height you are. But clothes are generally designed for people with a, uh, a sort of neutral ape index, yeah. where your span is equal to your height and that's the proportions. Oh. But a lot of people have spans much greater than their height, like Michael Phelps is the best example, and that's why he's so good at swimming, because his arms are just like... He's giant. Like, he's like Mr. Tickle. He nearly, nearly reached the other end of the pool. Yes, <laughs> done. Connor might have some good advice. Maybe we'll ask him, he can comment in the comment section yeah. down below. Well, as, as we said, that's all we've got time for this week. So sorry if we didn't get around to answering your question this week, but be uh, persistent. Keep your, your questions coming in down in the comment section below, and hopefully we'll get round to it in a future episode. And uh, yeah, thumbs up, share it, like it, all that jazz. Subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one. Yeah. Bye. See ya.